Okay. Um, so uh, I hope you all are enjoying um, the, the, the harmony um, between our, our various sets of talks where harmony doesn't mean unison, but uh, different tonalities, different styles. We just had a beautiful exposition of, of laser technology, and now I'm going to steer us back to some of these issues of, of principle. Um, and uh, Rana and I have this interesting um, division of labor that, that, that he worked out that I, that I hope you will agree, I think, I think is, is a good thing, I hope you will agree it is, where um, I'm, I'm taking more of the principle and where principles even get complicated, I'm taking the uh, principles light and, and Rana's doing principles deep or applications. Here it's principles light versus principles deep. I'm going to talk about shot noise uh, in, in the light form, and where it, uh, that is to say from a classical point of view and where it gets uh, complicated and, and quantum mechanical, Ron is going to pick up after, uh, after my talk. Uh, so here we are in, in my outline through, through the 10 talks. And here's an, an outline for, for this hour that we're spending together. I'm first going to return to a few slides that, uh, that I skipped uh, yesterday uh, for, for lack of time that set the overall standard of the challenge of making a gravity wave detector that is sensitive enough to, to do the job. And then after I've talked about the noise problems at the, at the highest level, I'll start moving us into this one specific, very important noise source, namely shot noise, which does have a second face, uh, the radiation pressure noise, uh, that is also in turn related to, uh, to the quantum limit, or lack of a quantum limit. Okay, so let's get ourselves good and scared about whether it's possible to succeed in this, in this quest. Uh, we have a number of issues that a sane person ought to think are maybe uh, close to impossible to achieve. So here's my favorite list of four impossibilities that we are going to turn into uh, things that actually can be accomplished. One thing that we don't always remember that is really hard is doing interferometry with free masses. Um, I'll say a little bit more about why that should scare you if you've done some interferometry and then uh, how we make it work. Uh, this We did talk uh, yesterday about needing to reach 10 to the minus 22 sensitivity. Um, that number should be shockingly small. Um, <laughs> when you turn that strain sensitivity into a displacement sensitivity, what is the effective motion of a mirror uh, that corresponds to a strain of 10 to the minus 21 or 10 to the minus 22 in an interferometer. It's a shocking number compared with any length scale that you uh, think about from the structure of matter, let alone the gross macroscopic objects uh, that we uh, build interferometers out of. And then when you remind yourself of uh, uh, what kind of noise levels there are in the environment? All of these noise, uh, all of these other requirements seem seem shocking. Rana showed you a picture of Michelson's interferometer. Um, uh, we might have zoomed in on some of the details, but I think it was clear even from from the version of the photograph that that Rana showed that. When, you, when Michelson invented the Michelson interferometer, he bolted everything down. And for good reason, in fact, he did a lot of engineering of really good mounts. Okay? As we now buy from catalogs he had to design from scratch and make. Why? Because um, you only see interference if you've got your beams overlapped and stably overlapped in the first place. And you only have uh, something you can read Michelson with his um, uh, telescope or microscope looking at, at, at fringes. Is this thing working okay? Um, oh, okay. We're, 
<laughs> now I don't hear. Is this, is this good now? OK, great. Um, uh, Michelson uh, looking at the, at the beam spot, or us putting uh, two parallel beam spots superposed and landing them on a photodiode, there's only something to read if the interferometer is not swinging through fringes. So both the angular alignment and, and, and the longitudinal stability are crucial for using an interferometer because, uh, remember, the diagram that Rana showed you first and that I also showed you of the relationship between the power at the output port of the interferometer versus, call it delta, um, delta phi or x or whatever, it's a highly nonlinear output. And we can only use this if we pick some small operating range and live in there, it's only then that the power is a measure of, um, of, of, the, of the thing we're trying to measure, the phase difference between the light returning from the two arms. So this ought to seem ridiculous. Um, here is um, another thing that ought to seem ridiculous. How can we possibly achieve a uh, sensitivity of 10 to the minus 21 given that the natural sensitivity even of an interferometer is, no, is nowhere near this. And what I mean by natural sensitivity is normally when I think about how to measure something, my prototype is a ruler, a meter stick. And I say, okay, what's the separation between the finest tick marks on a meter stick? All right, my meter sticks, it's a millimeter. And I put my eye there and I can estimate where something is to tenth of a millimeter or a little bit better, okay? Anyway, that millimeter up to a factor of 10 or so is the natural resolution of a meter stick. I've got a natural resolution of my wavelength of light for interferometric precision. That's what tells me about, you know, bright versus dark over here on this graph. That's like tick mark for this, for 39 millimeters and 40 millimeters. Divide that by the length of an arm, um, and uh, you, you, get, you, you get a number that is nowhere near 10 to the minus 21 or 10 to the minus 22. Now, Michelson did do better than reading bright versus dark. My reading of his 1887 paper is he was claiming roughly a 20th of a wavelength for, for the resolution that he thought he could reliably measure. And so Michelson did make a, um, you can call it a, a, a strain measurement, what he did, with a sensitivity not quite as good as 10 to the minus 9. All right? We need uh, 12, 13 orders of magnitude beyond that. Um, we're t if you take 10 to the minus 22 and you... Uh, uh, say what delta x does that correspond to in multi-kilometer arms, you are talking about displacement sensitivities of 10 to the minus 18 meters, call it. That's ridiculous, right? Isn't that ridiculous? Tell me some length scales associated. What's the finest length scale associated with the structure of matter? What's the diameter of a proton? 10 to the minus 15 meters, right? How can we do this? This is ridiculous. Remember, okay, un un unless you believe it's ridiculous the first time you hear about it, you, you aren't excited enough to be in this business. So, um, now, what if we could solve all three of those worries? We've got piles of noise from our environment and from inherent uh, physical limitations of things made of stuff that ought to make this impossible. The most dramatic one is just the shaking of the environment in which we live. This, to assign a single number to it is a bit subtle, but roughly speaking, um, in frequency ranges that we do care about, the RMS shaking of a good floor is about a micrometer, not 10 to the minus 18 meters. Okay. 
even if we could filter it enough, and don't worry, by the time you leave this week, you'll believe that we can filter it enough, there's a separate question of the inherent shaking of the crucial components. It, what's the inherent fluctuation due to thermal effects, due to the Brownian motion of our macroscopic mirror thought of as a Brownian particle, due to the fact that it's at 300 Kelvin, well, for the center of mass of a mirror, we're talking of order 10 to the minus 12 meters or worse. And even if there were a solution to that, and I'll tell you what it is, okay, the mirror's internal vibrations cause the front surface to move with respect to the center of mass by 10 to the minus 16 meters or more. So there's layer after layer of apparent impossibility in this business. And so to understand what we're doing, we need to understand how, worry by worry, we deal with all of these, all of these things. Um, all right, and there's my cheery slide, my cheerleading slide from, from yesterday. Um, one at a time, we're going to, uh, we're going to attack, attack those worries. Okay, so it's handy to uh, sort our noises into categories. And one kind of categorization that's especially useful when you're trying to think about how big you ought to make an interferometer or some other aspects of the design that we'll talk about uh, uh, more that have already come up, like multiple passes through the arms, is to, characterize, is to sort noises into things that are actually associated with motions of the mirror surfaces. We call those displacement noises. And then there's a smaller but non-trivial non category of things that have to do with how finely I can resolve what the relative positions are through my measurement apparatus. And I'll call that kind of noise readout noise. And it's a readout noise that I want to talk about for the remainder of this hour. Um, namely the fundamental, the physically fundamental readout noise associated with interferometry. And that's the noise that we call shot noise. There is, as we'll see before I'm done and hand it over to Rana, uh, a kind of evil twin, or maybe it's a good twin, I don't know, to the shot noise as a readout noise, and that's uh, fluctuating radiation pressure in the light, uh, or radiation pressure noise. And it's the existence of those two twin noises together that raises the issue of a quantum limit in, uh, in gravitational wave measurements. Okay, now for some reminder slides from yesterday, just to set the stage for our, our, our shot noise discussion. So here are, is our selection of three test masses out of that uh, thought experiment grid that I had. And here's, uh, I've picked out these three to suggest a Michelson interferometer and I'm reminding you that at some instant while a gravity wave is passing through, we've got a lengthened arm and a, and a shrunk arm. And that's what we're looking for. And that's how we mechanize it. And here is the reminder of the basic physics of an interferometer as a length difference to brightness transducer. When we superpose the light from the two arms, are they in phase, out of phase, or something in between? And the question that's going to arise is, how finely do we have to measure the something in between? There's the diagram I just drew on the board. Now, here is the statement of moving from, from, from Michelson's apparatus to something of the size of LIGO. So instead of just the uh, the few meters to few tens of meters that once Michelson had put all of his beam folding on his granite table, he could achieve. Let's say we've got a four kilometer installation and maybe we multipass by 25 times just to get a round number. That tells you the length of the arm. And now if I were as naive to say I can just tell the difference between bright and dark, I'm talking about something around a micrometer for the numerator of this natural sensitivity uh, scale. And it's miserable. It's 10 to the minus 11. All right. So that says, not only can't I be in the business of just registering bright versus dark, 
But instead, I have to ask the question, can I achieve a sensitivity in brightness, since that's my measure of arm length difference, that's one part in 10 to the 10 or better. If we really need to go up to 10 to the minus 22, we're probably going to do, need to do better than one part in 10 to the 10 in a, in a power measurement. Can I do that? If I can, then, there's, uh, then I've solved my readout noise problem. If not, then I'm stuck on my readout noise. Okay. So, if, just to belabor the obvious, all right. Can, if I want to, to measure something that's 10 to the minus 10 finer than this distance, I need to do something that is a precision of 10 to the minus 10 in, in this power, in this power height. All right. Now I will do the closest thing to classical physics that lets me say anything. I will talk semi-classically about our light, which is to say, I'm going to say that our uh, beam of light consists of photons. Okay. So I'll just bring in Planck's constant just enough to set the scale for the, for the number of, of photons that are going on. Um, so if I know the power in, uh, in my light beam, I can turn it into a number of photons per second by, uh, by just this, this prefactor that brings in h bar. I would have liked to have used h, but I'm already using h. 2 pi h bar c there in the denominator, lambda in the numerator, tells, tells me the size of packet, the number of energy packets I've got in my light beam. And now I have to just make an assertion which I will, I will just assert, and it can only be justified by going beyond the level of physics that I'm actually going to, 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 to use in, in my time here this morning. Namely, I'm just going to assert that if we have an ideal laser beam that is supposed to be sending n bar photons per second uh, out of its output, that, what it, that it cannot do better than sending out um, a Poisson process whose expectation value is n bar photons per second. And that in any given second, I'm going to throw the dice again, and uh, the actual number of photons that will leave the laser in that, in that second uh, is, is drawing from a Poisson process with an expectation value of n bar. Those are some fancy words to say. Sometimes you get a few more, sometimes you get a few less. Um, and we'll talk about how much more and less characterizes uh, that distribution. And that is the, uh, the, the crucial question for us. So we're dealing with Poisson statistics. And uh, the colloquially, co colloquial name for that is shot noise. Um, and what we know is uh, from, from a Poisson distribution that we can characterize the width of that distribution in a very simple way uh, once we know, know, know the expected value. And the simple way is precisely that the typical fluctuation is uh, equal to the square root of the expected number of objects in any given sample. So uh, I wrote a lot of words there, but they bas basically the title says it, that if we're, ex if we're expecting n bar, then square root of n bar is, what we ought, is, what we, is the size of the fluctuation that we'll see. Now, I want to do one other thing with this idea, and that's to remind you that that says I've got more photons per second, that means I've got a bigger fluctuation. But I don't really care so much about the absolute size of the fluctuation. I want to know where I am on this pattern, which I can think of as a normalized pattern. I really care about left versus right. So what I really care about is the fractional fluctuation in the number of photons in each measurement 
that, that, that I make of the brightness. So since I'm interested in the fractional fluctuation, I'm, I want to know uh, all right, uh, how big is my fluctuation and divide by my mean value. And that will tell me my fractional fluctuation. So square root of n bar over n bar is 1 over square root of n bar. So rule number one is if you want to make this, this measurement problem less important, use a more powerful laser that where n bar is, is bigger. And you win like the square root of, of that power. So we're going to solve this problem if we solve it, and, and, we, and we are, just barely, using um, a lot of the technology that, that Ali just ex explained to us, uh, by making the laser powerful enough. Yes, Taran. No, it's, um, it really is the, the number of photons that could come out per second if at the output port I moved to, to a bright condition. Okay? Um, All right. And now, now, now here's something where, where I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about an answer that I'm not going to derive. All right. The only thing I can more or less see how to do in my head is to talk about picking an operating point mi at the midpoint of the fringe where the slope is high. That's the sensible place that one would set up as, as an operating condition. It's actually not a deeply sensible place, but let's, let's talk about that first. Okay. Here you've got the, the steepest connection between uh, displacement and, and power. So, of course, that's what you'd want to, to choose. Okay? So, I know how to analyze that. Okay? That's, that's, about, that's a, almost the limit of, of my ability to analyze. Now, as it turns out, there, well, there is an obvious flaw with that operating point, and that is that if, in addition to the shot noise we're talking about, if the laser has power fluctuations that are extraneous, which they usually do in spite of Ollie's best efforts, why don't you make it better? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, then all of that shows up by a gigantic fluctuation in this whole pattern, and I can't tell the difference um, if I'm holding it at an operating point, whether the whole pattern jumped up or down, or whether, whether I just had shot noise. So this is actually something we should worry about for that reason. Now, the miraculous idea that was used in initial LIGO and that's been modified somewhat, and I might punt to Rana on how, how, how that modification is being done in advanced LIGO, but here's a miracle that Ray Weiss proposed based on having been a postdoc with Bob Dickey who you can maybe make the, the claim was the inventor of this, of this kind of technique. Um, the, the initial LIGO solution to the, to the power fluctuation, to the excess power fluctuation problem, was to make the apparently ridiculous choice of an operating point be the dark point. It's clearly ridiculous on the face of it because what is the, the slope of the of this operating characteristic we're doing is zero. Okay? You move to the right, you move to the left, you don't change the power at all at the dark port. Okay? It's on the face of it ridiculous. It's not ridiculous because you don't just do that. You add a little modulation so that um, the operating point is actually moved back and forth. If you're centered on the dark port, you only see second harmonics of that modulation and nothing of the first harmonic. If you drift off to one side a bit, you start growing a signal at the first harmonic, the, the fundamental frequency of, 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 of that modulation. Now here's the mathematical miracle okay, that I have followed and repeated, but I won't do it right in my head. Okay? Your signal is, has gotten very small because you've moved to a place down by the dark port. But the shot noise actually at the dark port in the number of photons 
has also decreased because you've gotten to a place where the brightness is almost zero except for the fact that you're wiggling back and forth. Those two effects happen by the same factor. The apparent sensitivity that goes away and the reduction of the noise happens so that the, the, the shot noise limited signal to noise for a properly modulated signal down here is the same as this. That's a miracle. Okay. I wouldn't have guessed it, okay, but it's, but it's true. So, and then the other miracle is that then at the dark port, you don't care nearly so much about these, these excess, uh, excess power fluctuations. Okay. Now, I'll say the words about what's being done in advanced LIGO, but I can't say them with conviction. I'm going to punt the Tirana. That is, what's being done in advanced LIGO is a dark port system with a zero frequency modulation. That is to say, a small offset from the dark port. And Rana will explain why that's actually better than either this, which we know is bad, or than the RF modulation scheme that, that was used before. Okay. But um, I'm just going to assert that for purposes of the shot noise, we can understand it from the naive operating point, see, what, see what's going on. And then as a second layer, you can ask yourself about how, how you move to the, to the dark port and how, how the, uh, the signal-to-noise stays the same. Okay. I've already said this. Okay, now let's make some numbers. All right. I picked numbers illustrative of the initial LIGO situation because I'm, I'm an old guy and I'm living in the past. Um, so what if we had 200 watts of one micron light? That gives a photon flux of 10 to the 19 photons per second. And one over the square root of that is getting close to our 10 to the minus 10 factor that, that we need. So this is the ballpark of what we need to make shot noise small enough. A rather large power by, well, we surely did not own a 200 watt laser back in uh, the early 2000s when initial LIGO was running. We had something that was called, what, an 8 watt laser uh, or a 10 watt laser. And the idea that, that, uh, that people like Ollie could bring us 200 watt lasers seemed, seemed a little fantastic at the time. So we, sh we shone 6 watts uh, into the interferometer and then went through the trick that Rana introduced for us yesterday of power recycling, of sitting on the dark port, letting all the light that didn't go to the dark port come back towards the laser, putting in a mirror there to send it back in, setting that up in a locked resonant way so the light built up. And we, in fact, achieved power levels sufficient, just barely, well, sufficient to bring the shot noise to where we did, which was <coughs> sufficient to reach 10 to the minus 21 sensitivity. So this is where the requirement on the light power comes from, getting the photon flux up high enough so that the square root of that uh, number of photons per, 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 uh, per measuring interval uh, gives us a, a low enough level to meet, meet our sensitivity target. Now, um, We talked some yesterday about making a long arm. And um, on the face of it, it's kind of obvious why you want to make long arms. And then by the time we finished with our uh, discussion yesterday afternoon in the discussion period, Rana reminded us of a few layers of subtlety. But I want to back away one layer of subtlety to 20th century physics and just get the, the basic uh, the basic concepts on the table. Um, it's, it's clear from the strain nature of a gravitational wave that the longer your arm, the bigger is the signal you have to look at as measured in meters. The fixed strain operating over a longer baseline gives more length change. And this chat noise is a question of how 
many, what fraction of a meter we can resolve. So if we make the signal bigger by having longer arms, we win. Now, for the purposes of this noise source alone, it doesn't matter whether we make the arm 100 kilometers long um, by spending 30 times the amount of money we have for a vacuum system, or whether we make just a big vacuum system with just about the amount of money we can get for a vacuum system, and then make a longer path by this technique of multi-passing that Michelson invented with discrete bounces on discrete mirrors that we implement with Fabry-Pro cavities in the arm. For shot noise itself, um, the, the, the signal to noise doesn't matter. Uh, we can do it either way. Now, to make that true, I have to assume that the reflectivity, that the, the losses that I have on my mirrors uh, don't actually start to, to, kill, uh, to kill the light power, then, then, then I've screwed myself and, and this trick doesn't work. But if I've got nearly perfect mirrors, this is telling me, okay, don't, don't bother with a huge, um, a, a huge vacuum system. Make up my big signal with, uh, with a very aggressive uh, multi-passing or, or beam folding. Now, Almost every other noise source that I will be telling you about uh, in the remainder of the week has a different character. It actually corresponds to the mirror moving back and forth in a noisy way by a certain amount. And, yes? Is coherence time of the laser going to be important? Well, it, it comes in, it, at least in this place, that um, I had, yeah, well, I'm about to say something silly. There, there's, there's probably a, 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 a better way to say this. Um, I, w I surely want my light to be uh, coherent over uh, the arm-like difference in the two arms. That's the simplest thing to say. In fact, though, all of these tricks that I'm using, first of all, multi-passing my Fabry-Pro cavities, and then power recycling, and then the other resonant tricks that I used to call signal recycling, I heard yesterday to call anti-signal recycling, um, actually involve um, uh, uh, light coherence over much, much longer time scales than that a huge amount of the effort in making these kinds of optical systems work is in making sure that the light is stabilized to a long set of lengths or lengths stabilized to laser wavelengths such that all these resonance conditions are met. And that's, that's a, a, a rather dramatic, um, call it coherence time or call it something else, phase purity uh, requirement. Otherwise, you don't get these, these buildups. Uh, all these resonances you know, rely in, in their fundamental physics on beam having the, 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 same, the same wavelength over um, as many wavelengths fit into hundreds to thousands of round trips through these arms. So is, is that an OK answer to, to the question? OK, good. OK, so let me just get back to, to, to this point of, of why I want to distinguish between displacement noises and shot noise. It's the existence of these displacement noises that is the reason that we needed to insist on rather long arms. Because we work really hard to make them small, we succeed to a certain degree, and then whether they are terrible or merely tolerable depends on how far apart the mirrors are. And more bounces doesn't help me at all because I've increased my signal by the number of bounces, but I've picked up the same increase in noise by, by encountering the mirrors multiple times. So, so it doesn't help. Well, 
And is, is the power recycling more aggressive? No. Okay. So, what else gets us our factor of 10? I'm not seeing a factor of 100. Uh huh. Is there a quick answer? Finesse is of arms. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, with that puzzle hanging over our heads, that hopefully Ron is going to retract enough of what is saying that the arm like that the that finesse doesn't matter, um, or illuminate us more on, on, on the uh, signal recycling tricks. Um, I want to introduce the, um, uh, the quantum mechanical issue that is uh, the reason we don't want to increase uh, the power, uh, power without limit. Why, in, in some sense, there can be such a thing as too much laser power as well as too little. And I'm going back to the early days of quantum mechanics and one of the, the famous quantum mechanics thought experiments that's called the Heisenberg microscope. And I haven't penetrated enough of the history of quantum mechanics to know why Heisenberg gets credit for it because the paper that I could find that really explained what was going on here in terms of the uncertainty principle was by Bohr. So I actually think of this as, as the Bohr microscope. But maybe Heisenberg asked the question and Bohr gave the answer. Um, so here is the, the story of, 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 the, um, um, uh, of, of the Heisenberg microscope. You've got a tiny thing. Call it an atom. You want to know where it is. You want to know where it is by shining light on it. When you do that, you see where it is by letting light bounce off the atom and look through some sort of uh, microscope, which you can think of for purposes of this as just a single, um, uh, a, a single objective lens. And depending on where this atom is, the uh, Reflected light either gives light that is traveling straight up with these parallel wavefronts or is traveling to one side or the other with, with tilted wavefronts. Okay, so now the question is can I, uh, arbitra with arbitrary precision, determine the location of that atom using a system like this? And the answer is no. And here is where you can see where there's this um, intimate connection between um, resolution of position and buffeting that changes the position um, that's inherent in the quantum nature of, of light. So here we go. Let's say I wanted to increase. Well, let's ask, what is the classical precision limit to, um, to how finely I can see where, where this atom is with an optical system? Anyone want to guess? Why, why might I think that if I only I redesigned this microscope a little bit, I could improve my precision and maybe if I were aggressive enough, um, improve it without limit? Light at the classical level is what kind of phenomenon? It's a wave, okay? And if I'm trying to, uh, through a finite aperture, using waves, determine where a wave originated, 
Is, is there a limit? It's diffraction limit. Okay. So, but what does the diffraction limit depend on? The diameter of the, of the objective. So, how am I going to improve it? Make a bigger objective. Now, ask the question, if I'm trying to do this at the ultra finest level, so that I'm using a photon at a time, what might become a worse problem if I have a bigger objective? A small objective just admits light through this narrow range, and I know within a narrow precision how much of a sideways recoil was applied to this atom. If, on the other hand, I have a big objective, the sideways recoil applied to this, uh, applied to this atom is much more uncertain. So, Bohr said, once you do it, and Bohr put in the Planck's constants in the right way, as you uh, increase the measurement precision, precision by expanding the objective lens, you also uh, necessarily increase the uncertainty, decrease the precision in the kick that was applied to that atom. And delta x times delta p greater than or, or, or equal to, to h bar comes right out of that argument. Um, from the classical optics of diffraction and the uncertainty in, in the recoil angle of that readout photon. Okay. Now, from a certain point of view, we can think of, um, of LIGO as a, uh, as a Heisenberg macroscope. Okay. We're trying to make very uh, measurements of relative positions of test masses over this multi-kilometer sized thing. And we have to ask our quest ourselves if we do the first thing we want to do, and I don't even want to call it naive, although at some level it's naive, let's improve the shot noise, improve our, 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 our readout noise uh, uh, precision by turning up the light power. That's what we're invited to do to reduce shot noise. Is there something that's the more or less the equivalent of the problem we get of uh, making a worse recoil from the quantum nature, not of one photon at a time, but from this larger and larger stream of, of photons that, that we're imagining, turning up the knob on, on Ollie's laser? Okay, so does the light buffet the test masses. Yeah, it does. There's a radiation effect, um, and uh, the more photons we have, the higher the power, first of all, the radiation pressure is. But what else do we have? What do we know about the irreducible fluctuation from shot noise in the light. More larger n bar, the absolute fluctuation grows, doesn't grow linearly, but it grows the square. So we have more fluctuating force on our mirrors with higher power. And the question is, is that something that, that, that is bad? The answer is yes. Does it tell us something about um, an optimum? And it's also yes. For um, a signal of any particular frequency, which determines the natural measuring, measuring interval, there's only some turn up until the buffeting of, of, of the mirror is now a bigger noise source than, than my readout noise. And this is why quantum mechanical issues enter into um, the, uh, uh, the question of how sensitive can we make a gravity wave detector. Under some circumstances, too much power can
can be as bad as too little. Okay, the, 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 the power should be, in this case, the power should be the, the, the flux hitting and, 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 and mirror. Um, I'm sorry, Sandal? Yeah, yeah. Right. And does, 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 does that make sense? Okay, so um, when when we work this out now, there's there's um, when I worked this out for for um, for 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 these numbers, I was um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So f this is for initial LIGO, and in initial LIGO there was no frequency. Um, that was that was dominated by radiation pressure noise, so we we never were near this quantum limit effect. Um, but as we are turning up the power uh, in advanced LIGO, that is that's no longer the case, and now I have to I have to be uh, a, a a little more careful about what the effect is of this. Uh, of a force noise on the displacement of uh, of a mirror. Okay, because at the end of the day, you want to be able to look At on, well, let's let's do it the right way. We want to be able to look at a power spectrum of thanks of the noise as a function of frequency to tell us well if I have gravity waves up at these frequencies say one kilohertz I want to know what my noise is, or if I've got a low frequency signal, uh, how, does, how does this set my limit for uh, looking at something at, say, 30 hertz? And this is all going to be expressed, as it must be if we're talking about a measurement of gravity wave amplitude, in gravity wave strain. Now, I, sh uh, I was talking 10 minutes ago about how the shot noise as a readout noise affected um, our ability to see displacement or, or strain. Now we're talking about a force noise. And the question is, how are we going to compare the effect of a fluctuating force to, uh, a fl uh, and get it into these units? And the answer is that the force kicks a mirror. And now we have to ask about the dynamics of uh, of the mirror, and we have to remember that a free mass for a given amplitude force moves more at low frequencies than it does at high frequencies. And in fact, the, the response goes like 1 over frequency squared for, uh, for, a, uh, for a force. So I've got what ought to be a white spectrum of um, shot noise, and I've got a white spectrum in the fluctuating force, but now I apply it 
to my free masses and the radiation pressure noise has this one over frequency squared characteristic which means if I'm going to compare it to my, my shot noise as a, as a readout noise I have to compare it frequency by frequency to, to ask uh, which is stronger. Yes. In initial LIGO, it was. OK. This, this is what one of the other amazing things about advanced LIGO is this, the, the seismic noise isolation is going to be good enough that y your statement, which was true for initial LIGO, will not be true at, at all frequencies for advanced LIGO. At the power levels that, we, that we're going to use and um, at uh, and with the seismic isolation that we'll have, there is a band, in fact, where uh, radiation pressure noise is, is, is large enough to, to be dominant. Okay? It's, it's, it's one of the engineering miracles of, of the move to advanced LIGO. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the, the function is dominated by the 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 very narrow response of, of the Fabry-Perot cavity, okay? So, um, then the second question is that you, in the previous one of the slides, you told that the detection system is positioned at the zero point, and you modulate the zero point in the mm -hmm. modulated frequency. So, mm -hmm. uh, in the Fabry-Perot transmission spectrum, we have a zero which is spanning nearly the almost one epicenter of the Russian mm -hmm. No, we, we're not living there. Okay, so here's the thing. Okay, I, 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 th I think I understand your question. Um, okay. Um, we've got, we've got two, two effects. The, the relationship between phase of light coming back out of a uh, simple Michelson arm that is either out and back or out and back with a discrete number of bounces is is just linear forever okay because of the resonance effect that you're reminding us of in Fabry Pro cavities For a Fabry Pro cavity, in effect, we've got that, and then nothing we can see elsewhere. The zero that I want to make comes from superposing the light from one arm and the light of another arm at the at the beam splitter and 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 making a dark fringe. I have to go to tremendous uh, care and trouble to constrain the motions of, of, of all of my mirrors such that I'm always in my Fabry Pro system living so that I'm close enough to resonance that I don't have to worry about the fact that, uh, that at most places, uh, most lengths of a Fabry Pro cavity, it's a, it's a pointless, non-functional arm, uh, arm length to, to, uh, to brightness transducer, okay? So what, what we're going to do is uh, by a, a multi-stage feedback system that we'll be talking about later in the week, guarantee that the fact that the Fabry-Perot response is null at almost every position, we're gonna guarantee that that doesn't matter by mechanizing a way to hold each cavity on resonance 
and on resonance, it's got the useful characteristic, and then for the two arms superposed, it behaves more or less like a really nice Michelson interferometer, but only through the tremendous trouble of, um, of forcing all those cavities to be resonant. And capturing that, capturing that resonant state from a cold, uh, from a cold start takes, takes a, a lot of cleverness. Hold, hold that question until we talk about feedback. It's a good question. It has an answer. Uh, let's not answer it now. Okay. So, so I hope this much was, was, was helpful, though, here. Um, what do I want to say? Okay, here's the slide that was... So let's get back to... Um, so I was just... Maybe I made my point about the frequency dependence of the competition between uh, radiation pressure noise and, uh, and, and shot noise. And at a, a range of low but not too low frequencies, a range of frequencies above 10 hertz, uh, we expect to have radiation pressure noise be one of our dominant noises. I consider that a, a miracle that we've gotten to that state, or, but, but we will. Okay, I don't want to, uh, time is, is just about out. I want to use uh, my remaining minute to set the stage um, for, um, for, for Rana's talk. And that is just to say that I waved my hands to say that we've got Poisson fluctuations um, in... Uh, in where photons go and where they show up. Uh, a proper quantum mechanical treatment doesn't let me get away with that. Uh, in particular, a, a, what starts as a proper quantum mechanical treatment says, whatever happens to the light arriving at the beam splitter, the wave function that describes um, the light that goes into the, the two arms uh, shouldn't say it's as if light's going one way and not the other. Uh, and, and, and once you start down the road of quantum mechanics, it becomes mysterious why there's any differential effect at the beam splitter at all. And this was only started to be worked out in a careful way, starting with the work of Carl Caves in 1980. Um, a beauty of what Rana is about to tell you is that once there was uh, a, a beginning of, of, a, of a deep and correct understanding of where the shot noise came from, there also started to be clever ideas about how that uncertainty could be manipulated in such a way that it can help us make more precise measurements than the naive considerations that, that, that I spoke of um, uh, uh, would lead you to believe. And so I think I'd like to hand the floor over to, to Rana to do a more sophisticated, quantum mechanically mature discussion of shot noise